Hi, everybody. My name is Amali Weber, and I am the program specialist at the Rochester Hills Public Library, and I would like to welcome you to this evening's program, the Know Your Why Health Talk, Heart Health Talk, presented by Ascension Providence Rochester Hospital. Before we get started, I'd like to take care of a few housekeeping details. Firstly, tonight's program will be recorded and available to view about one week from tonight on our YouTube page and on the RHPL website shortly after. We ask the audience members please silence or turn off their cell phones before we get started in order to avoid any disturbances during the presentation. Next, the friends of the RHPL, the friends of the RHPL seventh annual Wine, Wit, and Wisdom fundraiser is taking place at the library on Saturday, April thirtieth, from six thirty to ten ten p.m. Ticket purchasers may attend two speaker presentations from a choice of six and enjoy a buffet dinner, drinks, wine, beer, and soft drinks, a silent auction, and a fifty-fifty raffle. Tickets are $80 or $90 after April 11th. Registration opens March 1st. Registration forms will be available at the circulation desk and online at rhpl.org slash friends. Tickets may also be purchased online at www.winewitwisdom2022.eventbrite.com. Please note, if you purchase online, there is an additional $6.50 service fee per ticket. Tickets will be emailed to registered guests. If you do not indicate an email address, your name will be on a list at the entrance when you arrive. For more information and a list of speakers, please pick up a wine, wit, and wisdom bookmark from the table right at the entrance, the table that I was sitting at when you walked in. Our next program is Living with Dementia Part 2, which will be an in-person program this Thursday, February 17th. You can sign up for that at calendar.rhpl.org. And without further ado, please welcome our speaker, Dr. Koshi. Hello, and thank you all for coming out. Um, I'm going to be talking today about basically women and heart disease. There is one gentleman here with us today, and I'm just going to start off by telling you that the majority of the talk is for the women in here, and I may, you know, do a little man bashing a little bit, just a touch. So I apologize in advance. Um, February is Heart Month. Of course, it's Valentine's Day, and but in general, February is also Heart Month for everybody, but we in particular want to talk about women and heart disease because it is still the number one killer of women in America. So we're going to talk about a few things today. So I want to talk about why this is important. So I do like to show a little videos in here. These are the things that you'll hopefully remember. So hopefully they work. So they say it's a man's world? I don't see anybody's name on it. While they were doing their thing, we slowly changed all that. Today, women can do anything men can do. And there's one thing we're even better at. I think it's important to remember that whereas most people do feel that coronary disease and heart disease seems to be more like a man's disease, um, in particular, we call that one blood vessel in the front, what do we call it? The widow maker, right? It is also a widower maker. We all have it, men and women, but that's how much we've considered that this is only a man's disease, that heart disease and heart attacks only incur in men. But more women die from heart disease than from all forms of cancer combined. The three main cancers for women are breast, colon, and lung. Even if you combined all the women that die of those three, still more women are dying of heart disease. That's how important this topic is. Every 80 seconds, a woman dies from a heart-related issue or heart disease. That's a lot of women, if we think about, I'm gonna talk for about, oh, let's say 45 minutes or so, that's a lot of women that have just died in America from heart disease or related issues. When I was, I would say when I was in training, I would hear that breast cancer, and I'm sure you all remember this, breast cancer killed one in four women. What was that, like 15, 20 years ago? Breast cancer killed one in four women. Right now, breast cancer kills one in 40 women. That's how great we have done with breast cancer, right? Detection, everyone's educated, we get our mammograms. There's all sorts of advertisements, there's pink in October. 
but one in three women are still dying of heart disease in this country. So if you look around you, on either side of you, one of the three of you may unfortunately have heart disease or have a heart-related issue. 43 million women are living with heart disease right now. And I'm, when I say heart disease, I mean a myriad of things which I'm going to go into in a little bit. So heart disease can strike women at any age. There is no age prejudice with your heart. We were born with one, and so it can affect us at any age. And I know some people think that this is, you know, we'll see it when women are much older, but it can happen in women that are much younger. We're seeing more of that recently. The things that lead to heart disease start when you're young, for everybody whether it's a man or a woman. The things that we, we're going to talk about a bit more, like, for example, cholesterol, high blood pressure, all of those things actually begin in your 20s. But most of us don't see anybody but our OBGYN until we're, what, in our 50s or so? And then maybe we'll get a primary care doctor somewhere in there when our gynecologist finally says, I can't take care of all of this stuff. You've got high blood pressure. The things that we need to do and why heart disease is so important is 80% of heart disease is preventable. So we can make the changes that can prevent heart disease later on in life. So what are the reasons that women don't do anything about heart disease or like to ignore it a little bit? Again, most a lot of people still think that it's just a man's disease. Most women don't make their own health a top priority, not because they don't care about their own health, but in general, we know that women are the caregivers in the household. So we're taking care of our spouses, our kids, our mother, our child. And so, you know, going to the doctor, getting my cholesterol checked is probably last on my list of things to do because my husband needs to go to the doctor, my kids need to go to the doctor, we need to get them to school, my mother needs to go to an appointment. All of that happens first. And then somewhere in there, we may have made several appointments, but I bet many of us have canceled our appointments or postponed because somebody else had something to do and we were responsible, or at least felt responsible, to take them to that thing. I always remember when I had my first child, I have two young girls, when I had my first child, we went on an international flight. We're sitting on the plane and she's not even a year old and immediately the flight attendant shows up because I clearly looked like a brand new mother. And she shows up and she says, now, if that mask comes down, you put it on yourself first, not the baby. And I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. They always say that. She walks away. Another flight attendant comes over to me and says the same thing. She said, if that mask comes down, you put it on yourself, not the baby. I looked at her and I said, are you expecting something on this flight? And she said, no. And I realized after that what she was saying is, if I don't save myself, there is no way that that baby is going to be saved, right? It's the same thing that happens here. All of us that want to take care of other people, we are caregivers in multiple different ways. If you don't take care of yourself, you will not be there to take care of the person you want to take care of. So it is important even for their health for you to take care of yourself. A lot of women think that they're not old enough to be at risk, but like I said, by the time you're 21, that plaque is starting to develop. So that is the time that we're starting to work on a few things to prevent. And there is no time when it's too late to work on this. A lot of people feel they're too busy because the things that I'm going to talk about are all the things that we don't like, right? We got to change our diet and we got to exercise and take care of ourselves. These are the big changes that we don't like making because one, it affects our lifestyle and two, we don't have time for that. So I, I like to talk a lot about being caregivers and moms because I feel that's where most of us are. Being a mom, it's the greatest, it's also the toughest job in the world. Things do get more stressful for women and we start thinking much more about everybody else in our life. We feel guilty about taking care of ourselves. I definitely think that moms are more likely to take their children to see their pediatrician because of runny noses and ear infections than they are to realize that climbing a flight of stairs was not as easy as it was two months ago. I drove myself to the ER. I remember briefly blacking out during the drive. It was determined that my um, heart muscle was barely pumping. I don't have time to have a heart attack. You know, what's gonna happen to my kids? I was just thinking that you know, what they will do without me. It was really um, incredibly frightening for me. He said, Erica, are you okay? 
And I said, yes. And he said, I'm not asking you, are you okay? I'm saying, you're okay. You made it. My kids know that mommy's heart is sick. You love your children and you want to see them grow up. The only difference is that I may not. I hope so. This has given me the opportunity to turn my life around. I've really prioritized now. I also have learned the magic two-letter word, which is no. It protects you from becoming overwhelmed, from becoming stressed out, burnt out. If I take care of myself, my kids are going to do the same thing. You could prevent a lot of heart disease just by taking action. Hopefully my daughter will never, never have to experience anything like this in her life. It's been a very life-turning experience for me. So one of the reasons that I, in particular, like talking to women, not only do I talk about women and heart disease, and that's my passion, but women are also the storytellers in their families. Uh, it has been tradition in many cultures and throughout history that women pass down stories. We like to talk to each other and tell each other. So even if nothing I say here tonight applies to any of you, I hope that you go home and maybe at brunch or on a phone call, you talk to your daughter or your best friend or your mother or your aunt and tell them something because I have heard more than one time that someone's been at one of my talks and they've called their friend who suddenly said, oh my gosh, I am having those symptoms and they've seen a doctor and maybe you saved someone's life. We know that women do that. We know that I know for a fact that as a cardiologist, that all the men that I see in the office, every single one of them is brought in by their wives. Every single one. Because somebody here, like I said, this is more about women, but heart disease is heart disease. So maybe you're going to go home and think about your husband, your brother, your father, your son, and say, hey, I think that you need to see a doctor. So share the story, even if nothing I say t applies to you specifically. Now, you're sitting here going, oh my gosh, is it too late for me like, I'm way past 21, and so is it too late for me? No. 80% of heart disease is preventable. We can always make changes. The risk rises in women about 40 to 60 years old. The reason for that is our hormone shift at that point, right? We know that although there was at one point, at least what I learned was at 65 is when women start to have heart disease because somebody thought that at 65 is when we went into menopause. We all know that that is not true. Right, So somewhere between 40 and 60, our hormones start changing and shifting, and then there's perimenopause, and then there's a 10-year wait before you get to menopause. When we lose our hormones is when our risk rises exponentially, and we meet a man's risk for heart disease. Now, all of those women who have had hysterectomies at younger ages than 40 or 65, all of those women who have had difficulty with the pregnancy, your hormones are already shifted. But at this point, about 40 years old, is about the time that we really need to seriously think about heart disease. And then as the estrogen levels drop, then our risk rises. And that's when you'll notice that women who will tell me that their blood pressures were 100 or 90 when they were 20 and 30 years old, that suddenly they're seeing me at the age of 55 and they're wondering why they need three blood pressure medicines. It's not because there's anything wrong. It's just because we've lost our hormones by that point and we see that shift. Women start to have high blood pressure and then it, by the time they're 85-ish, all that blood pressure goes away. Whereas different for a man, when they get high blood pressure, they just have high blood pressure. But for women, it kind of goes along with hormones. Most women develop one or more risk factors for heart disease, which we will talk about in those years between 40 and 60. So I've talked a lot about, what, uh, about heart disease, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what heart disease can mean. So there's four major areas that we talk about for, for heart disease, and I kind of divide them as the pump, the electrical system, the plumbing, and the doors of the heart. So we'll talk about each one in turn. So the pump is the ventricle. That's actually the squeezing of your heart, right? Your heart is this big, the size of your fist. So if you look at your fist, that's how big that heart is. When you were little, it was this big, and now, now this is your size. This little guy is supplying blood to your entire body every day, all day, for all of your life. This is the thing that we're protecting. The ventricle is the actual pump. This is all the blood that comes from your body that we say is the unoxygenated, or let's say dirty blood, right? You've, you've breathed, you've got oxygen, the blood went to your bicep, you know, your belly, and now it goes back to the heart after it goes through the lungs to get pumped again because it just cycles. We don't get blood from anywhere. We just cycle the same blood all through our lives, right? So this pump, all the blood that goes in it has to go out 
to the body, to your brain, to your kidneys. So when the heart is not squeezing, it should be squeezing like this. When it's squeezing like this, or you're getting stiffer, we call that heart failure. When this happens, it's sort of like plumbing. This is the sink. If this sink is not squeezing and you can't get the blood out, just like any other sink or plumbing, it floods and all this blood's got to go somewhere. And so it starts backing up. It backs up into your lungs for a lot of women into their belly, like they feel like they're bloated, and into their legs. They get lower extremity swelling. You can't lay down because you can't breathe because your lungs are starting to fill up with fluid. So these are the symptoms we're looking for when we say congestive heart failure. It means that your heart has difficulty pumping for some reason, and you're looking for symptoms of shortness of breath, mostly with walking or, or exertion, Shortness of breath is never, ever normal. It doesn't matter if you are 75 or 85 or 95. Shortness of breath is not normal. Being tired as you get older is normal, but not being short of breath. Swelling in the legs, that lasts. So a lot of us women, especially if you've been pregnant before or you wore heels in your life, you notice swelling at the end of the day because you've been up on your feet. But you go to bed and you look at your ankles the first thing in the morning, you got nice skinny ankles, the swelling is gone. We're not gonna worry about that. That is unfortunately varicose veins. But if that swelling does not go away in the morning and you notice that you can stick your thumb in your foot or your leg and you get a thumbprint in that leg and the swelling's not gone away, you're calling your doctor because there is a pump problem with your heart at that point. I, I put this can't lay down to sleep. I hear very often that somebody says, you know, normally I would sleep, we ask this question as cardiologists and as cardiac nurses, you'll ask about, how many pillows do you sleep on? And most people say, well, I was sleeping on one. By the time they got to the hospital to see us, they say, well, I'm sitting up in my lazy boy because if I lay down, I can't breathe. So if you normally sleep on one pillow and suddenly you got to two pillows because you feel like you can't breathe, that's a problem. We don't want to see you after you're sta sitting upright in a lazy boy. We wanna know when you got to the two pillow stage, okay? So cardiomyopathy is the word for heart failure. Myopathy means a problem with the muscle, and cardio means the heart muscle, so cardiomyopathy. So that's just the fancy word for there's a weak heart muscle. The reasons for this are many. Some of them are very specific to women. For example, peripartum or postpartum cardiomyopathy. That is the unfortunate one that we cannot predict who's going to have, um, but that is when women either in the last trimester of pregnancy or six months after their heart muscle gets weak either during delivery or right after. Sometimes that improves, sometimes it doesn't, but it tells you again how important hormones are in women. Obviously men don't get this one, um, but hormones in women, nobody knows why it occurs. We just know that that hormone shift during pregnancy can cause the heart muscle to get weak. Some of those women will recover and some won't. Um, we in general would prefer that women who have had this type of heart muscle weakness don't get pregnant again because it may not recover the next time. Coronary artery disease, that's the one that I'm gonna talk about the most. That's the most common reason for heart muscle failure and that's just blockage in one of the three blood vessels. So your heart, like I said, is this little guy, well it's got three blood vessels on top of it because it's a muscle just like your bicep. It needs blood supply as well. If there's a blockage in that blood supply, then the muscle can't squeeze. Chemotherapy, most commonly, breast cancer chemotherapy. Um, again, one of the ones that is more common in women, obviously. Some of the chemotherapy drugs can affect the heart muscle. Typically, your oncologist will actually have you get echoes or ultrasounds of the heart at one, three, six months of chemotherapy if they feel that your certain chemotherapy drug may cause a heart problem. Uncontrolled hypertension, high blood pressure. The reason we call it the si silent killer is there are no symptoms until the blood pressure is too high and you're very close to having a stroke, a heart attack, or heart failure. And so not controlling your blood pressure over a long period of time, if that heart has to squeeze against high blood pressure, after a while it just says, I don't wanna do it. And then it doesn't squeeze anymore. This is the one type of heart failure that does not recover once it occurs. So we really are, that's why, you know, as physicians in general, medicine doctors, cardiologists, nephrologists, we're really focus on blood pressure, why it's so important. Valvular heart disease, usually some of the things are the ones that you're born with, so one of your valves, like rheumatic heart disease, um, but one of the ones that you'll see as people get older is called aortic stenosis, that's the valve, top valve of the heart. As that one gets tighter, that one we usually can't predict, but we see it in 70, 80, 90 year old people. Um, that one, if that valve gets tight, again, the heart's trying to squeeze against it and can get weak. This one's the most interesting one, stress-induced cardiomyopathy, or we call it broken heart syndrome. Um, 
It is in general, I would say, 95% of the time only seen in women. We don't really know why it happens, but we do know, and the reason we call it broken heart syndrome is it is most often seen when a spouse passes away. So usually within the first few weeks of uh, usually some, someone in the family that a loved one has passed away, you'll see a woman come in with signs that look exactly like a heart attack and they are in florid heart failure. Um, and so we call it broken heart syndrome. I've seen it after a mother has fought with her daughter who ran away from home. I've seen it m with fights amongst family members, but most often I see it when a spouse has passed away. Um, I always find this one interesting because it does not happen to men. Clearly don't care about us because it never happens to men. Um, but it only happens to women. This one, if you're going to choose, if God says to you, hey, you get to choose the type of heart, you're going to get heart failure, but you want to choose one, this is the one you choose because after about four weeks, this one recovers on its own. Again, we think it's this hormone shift, adrenaline, stress, all of that. And then after four weeks, we still put you on all the medicines like we would for any other person who had a heart attack. Um, but after four weeks, this one recovers on its own. So if you're going to choose one, that's the one to choose. And lastly, the one that we know, of course, that can cause heart muscle weakness is any virus. The flu, COVID, the common cold, any of those can cause a heart muscle weakness that may or may not recover depending. The next thing I'm going to talk about is the electrical system, so arrhythmias. This is the electrical system of the heart, right? You've got your own pacemaker that has set your pace from the time you were born. So some people will notice that they have palpitations. That word that we use, palpitations, just means any funny feeling in your chest that's not pain or discomfort. So fluttering, butterfly, skip beats, fast heart rate, slow heart rates, um, extra beats, any of those are called palpitations. We want to know about that because the older you get, there's more risk of having things like atrial fibrillation, which can cause strokes. We want to make sure that if you have that, a lot of women will say they've had some palpitations all their life. When it becomes more frequent or more concerning or you're passing out because of these, these are serious issues. The next one, valvular heart disease. You have four valves in your heart. They can either be stenosed or stenosis, which means too tight or they can have regurgitation, which means that they're leaking. Um, these valves problems can cause heart failure, which is why we don't want that muscle to ever get weak. That's the only thing we really care about as cardiologists. We don't want this muscle to do this. We always want it to do this. And so if a valve is causing an issue, then we talk about replacing or repairing the valve. You can have congenital valve disease. That's something you were born with. You can have rheumatic heart disease, which we're not seeing very much anymore because we treat strep throat, um, or mitral valve prolapse. I will say that many women in the 70s, 80s, and early 90s were diagnosed with mitral valve prolapse. By the criteria definitely changed, um, and so you may or may not actually have that. I would recommend if you were diagnosed and never had an ultrasound of your heart, an echocardiogram, that you should get one because if you truly do have mitral valve prolapse, this can cause usually 80s to 90s will cause severe leaking of that mitral valve and you might need a replacement. Okay, I talked over those ones really quickly so I could get to this one because this is the most important one. Coronary artery disease. So coronary artery disease means that there's a blockage in one or more of your three blood vessels to your heart. I'm going to put my mic down for one second because I, I need to show you this. So remember, heart, on that heart you've got three blood vessels. That's it. They are the size of a strand of your hair. Those three blood vessels are what give your heart blood so it can actually squeeze. Just like I got blood vessels that go to my bicep that make me do this, something's got to make that heart squeeze. So this is not the blood in the heart. This is the blood on top of the heart. If there's a blockage in one of those tiny, tiny blood vessels, well, then there isn't enough blood getting to that heart. So now it can't squeeze. Okay, so this is when we start talking about things like angina, heart attacks, blockages, stents. So that's what we're going to get into. Well, maybe. Go where I just did. Okay, so there are three main blood vessels. So if I think you can see my arrow, there's a left circumflex. It kind of goes over to the side. You have the left anterior descending. That's the one in the very front. The reason it's the most important and called the Widowmaker, why you can die from bl a blockage in this one, is it supplies the majority of this heart muscle. But like I said, they call it the Widowmaker, but it is also a widower maker. Um, and then there's the right coronary artery. That's the blood vessel that goes out to the back. So it's the smaller one. It doesn't supply as much muscle, but still just as important. That's it. That's all you got. You got three and you got some little branches that come off of those. So you have to protect those three. 
So what is a heart attack? A heart attack in our world is called a myocardial infarction or an MI. This means that there was a sudden blockage of one of those three blood vessels and it completely stopped blood flow to that portion of the heart. This is due to rupture of plaque. The reason that you can have a heart attack and have had just a stress test four weeks ago that was totally normal, you all have heard those stories. They just had a cardiac workup three weeks ago and then, you know, Uncle Joe, he just died of a massive heart attack. How could that have happened? Stress tests and all the testing we do tells us about things that are developing. So it can tell us that, yep, you've got, you know, some heart disease, et cetera, but this heart attack happens in people that actually don't have as much blockage that we can't test for but have a lot of those preventative issues, so hypertension, high cholesterol. But it's a sudden rupture. It can happen for any reason. Let's say increased stress, smoking. Any of those things can cause this rupture and suddenly block off that artery. We cannot test for that. The only thing we can do to prevent this is to do all the things that we're going to talk about, all those preventative stuff. So we keep all your numbers the best way possible so that that doesn't happen. So let me give you a little video. The heart is responsible for pumping oxygen-rich blood to the rest of the body, providing the energy that the body needs to function. The muscles of the heart itself also need a supply of blood. The coronary arteries, one of which we see here, fill that need. Sometimes a cholesterol plaque forms on the side of the artery, reducing blood flow. If part of that plaque breaks through into the artery, platelets tend to attach to it, creating a blood clot further reducing or blocking blood flow. The blockage in the artery prevents blood from reaching part of the heart muscle. Without blood, the muscle is starved for oxygen, causing damage to the heart muscle. The heart attack occurs because the damaged heart can no longer pump properly. So coronary artery disease can come in a myocardial infarction or a heart attack you can also experience angina. Angina is a symptom in the chest, and I'm not going to say pain, I'll tell you why in a second, that occurs on a regular basis, usually with some type of exertion. So women don't typically say pain, but discomfort when I'm walking up the stairs, tightness when I'm walking up the stairs, but it happens on a regular basis. Like I know that at the second flight of stairs, I'm going to have this symptom, or I know when I walk on the treadmill, when I get to five minutes, I'm having this symptom. That is angina. That means that the blockage is not 100%, like a heart attack, that there's no blood flow. It means that there is some blood trickling through, but there's typically a blockage more than 70%. This is chronic plaque buildup. This is what we test for. This is what your stress test, your echo, all of those things, a cardiac cath, that's what it's testing for, is to look for this plaque buildup, because then we're going to try and get this plaque buildup to decrease or at least stay stable for as long as we can. So let's talk about the symptoms, because I just said angina. So, because you know I like the videos. So let's go. I suffer from heart disease, and I wasn't aware of the fact that I had family history. I'm a very active individual, and I was leaving um, an exercise class when I began to sweat profusely. I thought, basically, that I was having um, a hot flash. <laughs> I became nauseated and then I threw up and then again I thought that it was um, food poisoning. I drove to a friend's house. She told me I didn't look good and I told her it didn't warrant a 911 call so we walked to urgent care. I was diagnosed with having a heart attack and I had to be transported to a hospital. I didn't know the symptoms of a heart attack. I didn't feel like I was having a heart attack so I was in complete denial even in the ambulance ride to the hospital. I wasn't scared until reality hit. The scariest for me is coming home because I really thought that I was doing everything right. Being active, I was a single mom, so my son and I made a game of grocery shopping by watching labels and reading labels. My body just couldn't handle the cholesterol levels that it was at. The heart attack uh, made me realize that I needed to review my family history. My family members that suffered from heart attacks, they didn't live in the same city that I lived in. So I had to really go back deep on both sides. High blood pressure, number one, runs in African American culture and strokes and heart attacks. And we have to change our eating habits definitely know your family history. Dig deep because that is a preventative measure. 
So I'm going to show you this picture of what men have and what women have. Now, this is not all inclusive, but in general, what we see for men, it's pretty typical. So when I'm in an ER and a man says, I have chest pain, they do this. I have chest pain and they do this. And they say it's a heaviness, like an elephant sitting on my chest or a brick sitting on my chest. They're shorter breath. They may or may not have pain in their jaw, but they have left arm pain, right? That's what we see on TV. That's what everybody knows. If, if that doesn't happen, as far as we're all concerned, it's not a heart related, right? So if it's not up here and it's down, not down in the left arm, it can't be the heart. That's typically what men have. And they'll get this cold sweat, right? They'll say they're sweating, but everything that's coming out is really cold. That's men. Now look at the list that women have. Okay, it can be really anything. The ER rule at every ER is if a woman comes in with a symptom, anything belly button and up is a heart attack until proven otherwise. That is the rule because women come with all sorts of stuff. As a cardiologist seeing women, it is really hard to figure out when they are actually having a heart attack. So most women will tell you when you say, are you having chest pain? They will correct you over and over again because no woman says that they're having pain in their chest. It is tightness. It is pressure. It is a little discomfort. Mostly we all believe, and most studies have said, that women compare pain with childbirth. This is nothing like that. Even for men, this pain is not 10 out of 10. No one is clutching their chest and dropping to the ground like they do on TV. M almost everybody will say that if you consider 10 out of 10 pain childbirth or a kidney stone, Everybody who's had a heart attack would say that their pain was four or five out of 10. As you can see, that's why you would question, could this be a heart attack? Because it's just discomfort. So women say burning in the chest, which we all think is heartburn, right? That's the first thing that we're going to think. Or indigestion. They just feel something right here. Women's chest pain with their heart attack is here. What's this? Your belly, right? It's your stomach. This is where women have it. This is where men have their pain. So if you're having pain down here and you just didn't have Taco Bell and it's not your typical heartburn, you need to be concerned. I have seen more than one woman who have finished two or three bottles of Tums because they thought they were having heartburn before they showed up to the hospital, still trying to treat their really bad heartburn, but they were having a heart attack, but they didn't know because it was down here. I don't know why God made us this way. They get nauseous. They get dizzy or lightheaded. So you're walking, you just feel kind of lightheaded, foggy fatigue out of the ordinary. So like making the bed, if you were able to make your bed yesterday morning and suddenly you just can't do it because you're so tired, it's probably not because you didn't sleep enough, but you should be worried. Shortness of breath. This is why I say shortness of breath is never normal. 80% of women that come to the ER with a heart attack have no chest symptoms. They only have shortness of breath. So this is why this one's really important. Pain in one rare Pain in both arms, both shoulders going down both arms is more typical in women. Pain in the back, right here, where your bra clasps, right between your shoulder blades. And that may be the only symptom you have, which of course, if you were carrying heavy grocery bags or carrying a heavy child, you're not going to think much of it, but these are the things you need to think about. Jaw pain, a lot of women have seen their dentist because they get jaw pain, they think it's a toothache. The dentist says, not your tooth, you need to go to the ER. Neck pain up here like right up in the throat, sort of like a sore throat, but like an ache, like you slept funny. Sweating, like a hot flash. We experience those. And flu-like symptoms, of course, in the midst of COVID and flu season, that could be anything. But any of those symptoms, plus the elephant in my chest or left arm or a cold sweat, any of those can occur for a woman. So we talk about a woman and her sixth sense. If you feel like something is off, you need to get evaluated. We would rather you show up to the ER and say, I don't know, that was actually my patient last week. She literally walked in and said, I don't know, I just don't feel right. I can't even pinpoint it. And she was having a heart attack in that front blood vessel. If she hadn't shown up, she probably wouldn't have been there that next day. She had no symptom. She's like, I, I'm not having any symptom. I just, something's not right. That was her only symptom. If you think something is not right, you know your body. All you got to do is come to the ER. All they have to do is get you an EKG. That EKG is going to be the cheap, quick test, because like I said, any symptom, belly button and up, you get an EKG as a woman, and that test is gonna tell us if you're having a heart attack or not. Of course, there's blood tests and all that stuff, but don't apologize when you come in. We don't mind. We would rather that it is just your heartburn or it is just a muscle spasm, rather than we miss that heart attack. Because you may survive that heart attack that night, 
But now this heart muscle that was doing this is doing this, and now you're going to live with heart failure, which is the symptoms of that shortness of breath on a chronic basis. That's swelling in your legs. That stuff doesn't get better. So if you have a symptom, get checked out. You would take your husband's if they complained that there was something funny in the chest that lasted for 30 seconds, all of you would be calling 911 and you would drag them. When you have a symptom, no one else is paying attention to you. You make sure that you say, something is wrong, I need to get checked out. This is one of my, just a fun video, this is my favorite, um, because I, I feel like I am in this stage, as you watch this woman, you'll understand. I am in this stage of my life, and every time my, her voice is in my head all the time. But this is what I think, and we'll talk about why I think that women don't get the help they need, because this is what's going on in general. Well, if I can make it work. It started out like a totally normal day. <laughs> Okay, move objection deadline to the third line after survey. Oh, honey, for, for when you are, you always use the bird that's star. What are you doing down there? Did you finish your breakfast? Ow. Whew. Don't hit your brother. <laughs> honey, you have to eat something. Here. Okay, five minutes to carpool. Where's my coffee? Mm. You okay, Mom? Oh, I'm fine. Sandwich orders. What do you want? Almond butter and jelly. Spaghetti. Oh, you sure you're okay? I'm fine, sweetie. I am so late. Hey, buddy, how you doing? Uh, hey, honey. Hmm. You okay? Uh, yeah, I'm fine. You sure? Oh, yeah. Here. Acai, my favorite. Mm. See you guys later. Okay. Where are your shoes? Put your shoes back on, please. You know, go help your sister. We're going in three minutes. Oh my God, what am I doing? I forgot to cut off the crust. Voila, shoes on, potty if you need it. Honey, get your sister. Okay, get your shoes. Nobody move. I'm getting a dustpan. Oh. Mom, mm. I think you're having a heart attack. Honey, do I look like the type of person who has a heart attack? Totally fine. Don't forget to wear the high socks with the shin guards. Forget about the shin guards, Mom. <gasps> Come on, Mrs. Onerdog is not gonna wait. be having a little heart attack. <laughs> Nothing really, just some nausea, tightening of the jaw, dizziness, shortness of breath, muscle pain, achiness, this terrible pressure in my chest. Oh really? They can be here in how long? <gasps> Two minutes. Can you make it ten? I thought I had gas. Turns out, I was having a heart attack. Heart disease is the number one killer of American women. So now I take care of myself and tell the other women in my life to do the same. Make it your mission to save your life and the lives of the women you love. Find out more from the American Heart Association at GoRedForWomen.org. So I, I, I enjoy that video. Um, that is literally my morning every morning. Um, but I think that the two times that I hear every woman laugh when they watch that is one when she says, I'm sorry to bother you because that's what every one of you thinks. The second time is when she says, just give me 10 minutes because we all know we need to, you know, take a shower, make sure we look better before the ambulance shows up. But um, that I'm sorry to bother you. I have heard that so many times, even when people come to my office. I don't think it's anything, but you know, my husband says I should get checked out or my daughter says I should just get checked out. It's not a bother. We want to make sure it is better, like I said, that it is just your heartburn or it is nothing at all I rather than it is something and we missed it, right? Because remember, if you're not there to take care of those people, then you're not there. So we'd rather you take care of yourself. So how are we going to do this? Now we've heard the symptoms. We've heard what it is. What are we going to do? This is the part that nobody likes to hear about. The things that are out of your control. Who you were born to. 
That is out of your control, but you do need to know your family history. The family history that is most important is your mother, your father, and your siblings. Um, that's really, we don't really care too much about your grandparents and your uncles and aunts. That doesn't matter as much as your mother, father, brothers, and sisters. We actually take into consideration more when any patient, man or woman, says, my mother had a heart attack at the age of 60, then we care as much about their father having a heart attack at the age of 50. It is much more uncommon to hear about women who had heart attacks at younger ages. So that is a really important risk factor. You can't control it. Who you're born to is who you're born to. During your pregnancy, that also you could not control. History of preeclampsia, eclampsia, gestational diabetes, gestational hypertension, any of those puts you at a 10 times higher risk for having a heart attack in the future. So that one also you can't control. So these are things that you need to be aware of. We in general in our office, we prefer that if any woman had a, a, a baby and had preeclampsia, we see them at least once a year because uh, having a baby is the biggest stress test of your life. And if you had problems during that pregnancy, it usually means there's something wrong with the vasculature in your body. Age, I can't control it. The older you get, we just talked about, we're at risk. The things you can control, smoking. I'm not going to harp on it, but don't smoke. Smoking is bad. Smoking is not the other stuff in it that bothers your lungs and causes cancer. It's the nicotine. Plain and simple, it's the nicotine that bothers the heart. The nicotine causes that blood vessel, remember the tiny little strand of hair, causes it to spasm. Every time you smoke, you're causing you to self to have a blockage. That's what's happening. Over time, that vessel gets irritated and forms plaque a lot sooner than it should. High blood pressure, you can control high blood pressure. Yes, diet and exercise, and sometimes you need medications. High cholesterol, high triglycerides, these are things that we can hopefully change with diet and exercise, but often we need medications, especially if it's genetic. Being overweight. So being overweight usually is a precursor to hypertension and diabetes and those things, so we want to make sure that we're keeping our weight under control. I know nobody likes talking about that. Um, and making sure that we're exercising. Physical inactivity. This is the hardest one to get anybody to do. Any, people will starve all week and do a diet rather than exercise. So physical inactivity, this one's really important. I'll give you this personal story, um, basically why I became a cardiologist. So my father, right when I started med school, ended up with bypass at the age of 51. My dad was and is a runner. He, he has run three to six miles every day of his life as long as I know, except for the six weeks that he was recovering from his bypass, and he still does now. We did not know that he had any heart issues. His actual only symptom was this weird elbow pain, but he was a mechanical engineer. We figured it was from work. So eventually his doctor said, your cholesterol levels are just always borderline. Let's just check. He, pa he failed the stress test, went immediately to do cardiac cath. They found triple vessel disease. He went to bypass within three days. Did great. Now, when the surgeon walked out to tell us, she said, your father, because he exercised every day of his life, had what we call collaterals, which are all these extra branches. While your body is struggling to get blood, whether it's your leg or your heart or anywhere, your body makes new blood vessels every day of your life. So while my father was exercising, his heart was saying, oh my gosh, I can't squeeze like this and I can't beat like this. So it kept forming new blood vessels. He created his own bypass. She said she had difficulty finding room to put the new bypasses because he had so many, which is why he only had this one weird symptom, even while running, of this elbow pain, nothing else. He never had chest pain. He never had a heart attack. Exercise is more important than just losing weight or lowering your blood pressure. It helps because it's going to help your heart compensate so that hopefully you don't need bypass and you don't have a heart attack because your heart can survive with all of those blockages if there are any. So all you need to do for exercise is 150 minutes per week of cardiovascular. 150 minutes can be divided however you would like. So that's 30 minutes, five days a week. You want to divide that up even more, do 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the evening. Take a walk in the morning, take your dog out in the evening, take your husband out in the evening, go out for a walk. I know the weather is not conducive to that here in Michigan, but walk around your house, go up and down the stairs, anything counts as exercise. Um, but we want you to do some kind of physical activity. If you are a diabetic or pre or borderline or any of those things, in our books you're just a diabetic. We don't count pre and borderline. That puts you at a 10 times higher risk than the average person for heart attacks and heart disease. We actually treat you, your goals for blood pressure and cholesterol are as if you've already had your first heart attack. We can 
basically say 85% of people with diabetes or prediabetes are going to have a heart attack. So we treat you as if you already did so that we make your goals even more strict. We treat you like you have a stent place. We make your LDL much lower. We make your blood pressure much lower. Whether it's diabetes or pre or borderline doesn't matter. It's all the same risk. So who else is at risk for heart disease? Someone with PAD, which is peripheral arterial disease. That means a blockage anywhere else but your heart. Your carotid arteries, your subclavian in your arm, your leg, anywhere else if you've got a blockage, those are big blood vessels. They're like the size of your finger. So you can imagine if there's plaque developing in those, then remember these little strands of hair, there's plaque developing in that as well. Carotid disease, like I said, the arteries in your neck. Having a stroke, all strokes are basically clots going into the brain. All strokes come from the heart somehow. It's either atrial fibrillation, which is the most common, which is an arrhythmia, or you have other types of heart disease. If you've had a stroke or a TIA, you need to see a cardiologist for them to do a complete workup. Smoking, I'm not gonna talk too much about it, just don't, don't do it. Uh, there's only two things I say you cannot do as a cardiologist. Everything else I say is fine in moderation. You cannot smoke and don't use cocaine. Otherwise, I don't care what you do, just do it in moderation. High blood pressure. There's always all this talk about what the goals are. The cardiology goals have always stayed the same. They have never changed less than 120 over 80. That's what we're looking for. We want your blood pressure to be as low as it can go without you passing out. We're happy with blood pressures that are much lower. We, we also prefer that you're not on a lot of medications to get there, but if for a temporary measure while you're reducing the salt in your diet and exercising and losing 10 pounds, you might need three medications to get you there because we'd rather you do that temporarily rather than learn that the blood pressure was too high for six, eight months and then have a stroke and now it's too late. So do it for the year, do it for two years until you do those other things and work in partnership with your doctor to get off the medications. Most people can get off a lot of their medications unless it's genetic. High cholesterol, hyperlipidemia. For a cardiologist, the most of the patients that I see already have heart disease. They've already had stents, bypass, they've had a heart attack, et cetera. I want their LDL, which is their bad cholesterol, starts with an L, as low as it can go, down to 70 or below. That's what I'm looking for. I want your HDL, starts with an H, as high as it can go, needs to be above 40, for most women, this is the problem. So while you had your estrogen, your HDLs were like 50 and 60, and they were great. When that estrogen is gone, this is when the HDL drops. HDL is like Pac-Man. Remember Pac-Man? It eats the bad cholesterol. As this number starts dropping, well, now the bad cholesterol starts developing. These are the two numbers. We have not really very, medicine, very many medicines to increase your HDL, which is the H, to make it go high. The only things to do that is exercise, a little bit of red wine. Now, the doctor did not tell you to go get drunk. The doctor says one glass of red wine can help with that. Um, and then there's one medicine, Crestor, can help if that's your only issue is that your HDL is too low. Um, for women in particular, eating a bowl of oatmeal seems to work only for women, not for men. And I don't mean like the Quaker, you know, quick one with the strawberries and the blueberries in it. I mean like steel cut oatmeal, you know, carefully without milk with just water. Uh, if you do that, for a lot of women, that actually lowers their cholesterol really nicely. It's just the fiber and it works well for women. Your triglycerides are the one test why we make you fast before you get your cholesterol checked because that is your fat and your sugar in your diet. Obviously, if your triglycerides are high, your fat and your sugar are high in your diet, you want to decrease those fried foods, those sugary foods, all the good stuff. Um, exercise. We talked about this already. So 150 minutes a week, you're going to find something to do, whether it's dancing in your family room, walking, going outside as the weather gets nicer, you're going to find something to do. Aspirin. I, I bring up these last few things. There are just a lot of questions that people have. So aspirin, I, I, there's a lot of um, news about it recently. The news actually hasn't changed. I'm not really sure why it came out again because this came out a few years ago. Same thing. In all high-risk individuals, we are still using aspirin. If you've had a heart attack, you've had a stent, you've had bypass, you've had a stroke, you've had a TIA, you have a blockage in your carotids or your legs, you, or you're a diabetic, you are on aspirin, a baby aspirin for life. There is no change in that. You don't come off. Um, but if you don't have one of those things, then you don't need to be on aspirin. So diabetic is included. Remember, we include diabetics and prediabetics in that coronary high-risk group. You do stay on a baby aspirin. There should be no reason in general that anybody is on anything higher than 81 milligram of aspirin these days. That does the trick. 
hormone replacement therapy. Lots of questions about this for women. In general, I would say that we just want women to be, and men, to be on the lowest dose of hormone replacement for the shortest amount of time with a goal of weaning off. Because if you don't wean off, then at the age of 80, when I make you wean off because you have AFib and now you're on a blood thinner or you had a heart attack, you're going to then undergo menopause all over again at, and you don't want to do that. So the goal should be between you, your gynecologist, your primary doctor, if you're on hormone replacement, the shortest amount of time with the lowest dose possible. For those people who've already had a stroke, a TIA, a heart attack, or blockages, we say no hormone replacement therapy at all because your risk of having another stroke or heart attack are too high. This applies to men too. We don't uh, prefer that men are on testosterone replacement if they've had a heart attack or a stroke or stents or blockages because it poses all the same risk. If you didn't make the hormone, it's not good for you. Stress and the heart. I cannot get rid of your stress. You can't get rid of your stress. It's just not going to happen. But we need to find ways to reduce and manage our stress because the adrenaline with the stress, so, you know, if you're taking, especially if you're taking care of a, a sick loved one or just the last two years, right, your stress level is like up here. For everybody, if you don't take care of that stress, your body is always fighting as if you're ch running away from a tiger, which means your heart is always beating really fast and your blood pressure's always up because those are the things you would need if a tiger was chasing you. But now your body just thinks, well, the tiger's just chasing me like forever. So now your body's doing that all the time. Well, remember that stress heart failure we talked about that women have? That is what happens. Your heart does this, all your hormones are up and eventually the heart fails. This can cause heart attacks, this can cause strokes, but the heart failure is the most important. So one of the easiest ways and best ways to reduce or manage your stress at least mentally, not only physically, is exercise. Whatever way of exercise you choose, it is good for your brain, not just your heart. I will say personally, in the last two years, at least at the beginning of this whole two-year cycle we've been going through, when all my children were at home and my husband was at home and I was working all the time, my stress level was up here. And I know that at that point, I mean, who was exercising? Nobody. But I realized shortly in a few months that there was no way I was going to survive everybody being homeschooled or not, figuring out what to do with all these patients who were sick. My husband was home all of the time, and I had to figure out what to do with him, right? And so I'm coming home and cooking and getting laundry, and two children want to play with me, and it was just a lot going on. And I know for me, taking 10 minutes out of my morning, I wake up early before anybody else is awake because I don't want to hear a single sound. I want no one to touch me. I, at least when the weather was nice, I go down, I sit, and I have my cup of coffee. I needed that 10 minutes by myself because that was the start of my own day. Without that peace of mind, I could not function. That 10 minutes led to an extra 15 minutes. Now I'm just going to go down in the basement and work out. Now that's led to without that hour in the morning. So I wake up at 5 because my kids don't wake up till 7. I wake up at 5 and I work out because I realize that those days that I don't, I want to kill everybody. So it is really important for your mental health, not only my physical health, but also my mental health. Now, as you know, as you've learned my family history, my father had heart disease at a very young age, and actually all of his siblings and his father also did. So my risk is up here. And so I also am exercising for my own heart health to manage my blood pressure um, to make sure my cholesterol stays under control because I want to be there for my young children. So type A personalities, I would say majority of women are a type A personality because we can't function that way, especially if we were caregivers of any type because we have to have a routine and a schedule because I know if my like one thing doesn't work out that day, my whole day is ruined because if my schedule is not right and if something gets messed up, then I can't stay organized. And that's a big thing. That's a type A personality and that's because that's necessary to function for most of us, right? So those are the things we need to be able to manage our stress a little bit. So whether it's meditation or yoga, just exercise, taking a walk with your friend so that you guys can chit chat out there, that's great too. That's exercise also. So you kill like a bunch of birds with one stone. Here's the last bit that I got to tell you. So exercise. Know your numbers. This is critical. When you go to your doctor, whether it's your primary care, your gynecologist, your cardiologist, you don't want to walk out there because I hear this often. How is your blood pressure? Oh, my primary doctor said it's good. But what was the number? I don't know. They said it was good. Uh-uh. 
you need to know what that number was. Well, was it 140 or was it 120? I want to know what that number is. The reason I want to know what that number is is because if you show up to my office and your blood pressure is 140 and you don't know what your blood pressure is otherwise, I'm treating that blood pressure. But if you can show me that at home or your other doctor's office, your blood pressure really was 120, I'm not treating the one in my office. Everybody's high in my office. You're coming to see a cardiologist. It's going to be high. Know your cholesterol. Know where your LDL is. You want to ask, what is my LDL and what is my HDL? What is my goal? Doctor, knowing my other history, where, do you, where should I be? And then how are we going to get there? And how long are you going to give me? I, I don't always start every, I mean, if you had a heart attack, you're on a statin. There, there, there's no and ifs or buts about that. But if you came to me as a prevention and said, my cholesterol is high, I'm not going to say you immediately have to be on medicine. I do give you time. But if the cholesterol is really high, I don't want to say, we're going to leave this for a year and good luck. I want to make sure that we protect you. There is always a way to work with your doctor to get off the medications, work in partnership. We're not there to just load you. We're there to help you get to your goal. So if you can get your cholesterol down, I will always trial you without the medicine, give you three or six months to try on your own, but we get a goal. If you don't make it and your report card is not that good the next time around, then we both have already agreed that we're going to start the medicine. So these are the numbers you should know. Where's my blood sugar? I know nobody wants to know their weight or their BMI, but these are numbers that you really should know because we need to know where we are. Your weight should not be the weight at the doctor's office. should be your weight at home based on, you know, morning, unclothed. There's a running joke in my office about how men, when they get their weight checked in our office, they're, I got their boots on and their coat, their phone and their wallets in their pocket. They just get on the scale. They don't care. Women come in, they take off their coat, their purse, their bracelets, their rings, their earrings, their shoes. I mean, they're naked on our scale trying to get that weight down. But that's the weight I'm looking for. I'm looking for your naked weight in the morning. That's the weight you should know. Don't, I mean, doctor's scales, if I go from one room to the next, my weight jumps up 10, 10 points. So, you know, follow your own weight. But these are the numbers you should do. Um, eat healthy. Yes, you can have a steak every once in a while. Have those french fries. That's okay if that's what you have to have. Just don't do it all the time. Uh, avoid salt. Anybody who has high blood pressure, you want to avoid salt. No salt shaker to the table. Don't add salt to your food. Everything that we buy in this country that's processed has salt in it. There, if you actually start to read labels, you will see the amount of salt you are getting more than your daily need in a, a, a slice of bread. So don't add salt if you can avoid it. See your cardiologist for checkups. If you have diabetes, you should be seeing a cardiologist once a year because you should be getting a stress test every three years no matter what. If you had any of those pregnancy-related complications or you know somebody who had a pregnancy-related complication, they should be seeing a cardiologist once a year at the least. If you have family history of heart disease, see a cardiologist once a year to help with the prevention. And then lastly, if you know someone that is experiencing the symptoms, don't be like Kimberly and walk to the urgent care. Please call 911. I don't want you driving on the road while I'm on the road as you're passing out. I want you to call 911 because the EMT that arrives there, one, at Ascension Providence, Rochester, they transmit the EKG from your house in your living room to our ER. That means the cardiologist is ready and waiting from his house in the ER before you get there. They are treating you in your house before you, time is muscle. That is the key here. Remember, all we're trying to protect is that little guy, right? We want it to do this. We don't want it to do this for very long before we can recover that. Don't have somebody else drive you. Want to hear Actually. a joke? Oh, yes. Yeah, sure. Sure. <laughs> What's the number one killer of women? Well, you're still here, so that rules out crankiness. <laughs> and tracksuits. Uh, heart disease. But that's a joke? Oh, no, it's an absolute fact, but the American Heart Association says you can save lives by passing it along to five women you love. Aww. <laughs> so I'm starting with three I tolerate. <laughs> That's a joke. Find out more at GoRedForWomen.org. All right, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> That's all I have for you. Thank you for listening. I hope you learned something, and I hope you share something. Thank you. And uh, I will take questions now if anybody's got any. Um, sorry, I, I, we hear a lot about supplements. Do you recommend any supplements for prevention, like fish oil or any of that? So supplements are a difficult one. One, because it's not regulated. So for us to say to take supplements, there can be some things in supplements since they're not regulated. But um, fish oils and stuff, unless you already have high triglycerides or some risk, no need. Um, 
it's not harmful to take a multivitamin for women and vitamin D. Uh, we're in Michigan. I'm sure most of your doctors have said you should be taking vitamin D because there's no one with a normal vitamin D in this state. Um, those are kind of the only things that you should be taking. Otherwise, only specifically if your doctor says these levels are low, I wouldn't take anything else extra. Anybody else? Yes, I love Rapatha. <laughs> yes, yeah, so Rapatha. So um, what she's asking about, Rapatha is a cholesterol medication that for those who cannot tolerate statins or their cholesterol is not reduced with statins, um, it's an injectable medication. It's done twice a month. So there's Rapatha and there's Praluent. There's actually a new one that just came out too. Uh, starts with an L. I can't remember the name. But that medicine works really well to bring down the cholesterol without any of the muscle aches and the, some of the toxic effects of a statin. Did you have more questions about it? Well, my doctor asked me to go on it, and I, I was doing it twice a week, and I felt bad for a couple days with it. And then I just had trouble with um, where the source I was getting it, whatever, and I stopped it. And, but my cholesterol's like 393. Yeah, you need that medicine? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, so we do start it twice, uh, twice a month. Once every two weeks is what most people do. Sometimes because it works so well, the cholesterol drops so much that we get to once a month. But if, uh, if it's a cost and pharmacy issue, there's Repatha and Praluent. Their drug reps do a really good job of helping you get it. And usually offices have samples of those because it's, it's hard to come by but they work really well. We give it to most of our patients nowadays who have had heart attacks and stents because their statin may not be doing enough to bring their LDL down to less than 70, so we put it in addition. Any more questions? <laughs> Don't do cocaine. Cocaine is bad. Cocaine uh, can cause heart attacks in general, and so we say no cocaine because it causes spasm, and we can't give you the medications we would need if you're using cocaine. So those are the only two things I say are not allowed. You want to drink wine? Drink wine. You want to eat a steak? Eat the steak, just in moderation. We do not... I guess I have to say this. We don't want you to be a rabbit and only eat. I mean, I can't do it. I don't think anybody else can do it. The whole point of helping and doing prevention and fixing your heart when you have a heart attack from a cardiologist's perspective is so that you can go out there and enjoy those things. If you can't enjoy those things, then what was the point, right? So if you want to go out and have that steak dinner at a restaurant, I want you to get there. I want to make sure that you can do those things you know, but I just don't want you to do it every day. I want you to do it, you know, once a month at the most, you know, for special occasions. Um, but yeah, those are the two things. I mean, er everything else, just be careful with what you do. You have to be able to live and enjoy it or else there's no point. More questions? You've been on uh, blood pressure pills for a long time. Is there a chance that you could go off of it? Um, the high pressure was it was high at the beginning, and now after like six years, it's normal or below normal. Um, yes, so that's a l often what we see with women. Like I said, it's that usually that hormonal shift that um, causes this high blood pressure for a lot of women. You end up on like three blood pressure medicines, and then you can often come down. So what you want to do is bring a blood pressure log in to the office, um, proving to us that it's really better than what we're seeing in the office. And yeah, absolutely, you can come off. I will say that for most people, they don't come off of all of them, but they can get down to one if you're on more than one. So then you can probably come off. Yeah, yeah. For most women, um, again, if you have things like heart disease and blockages, we are also using blood pressure medicines, not just for blood pressure, but for protection of the heart and the brain. So sometimes we're using it for other things. But if you don't have those issues, then we can often get everybody off of blood pressure medicines if you're doing the right things with diet, watching your salt, exercising. Those things can bring down, losing 10 pounds can drop your blood pressure th more than 20 points. Exercising in general makes all those blood vessels open right up and that blood pressure drops. If anybody's checked their blood pressure right after exercising, so not during, during your blood pressure goes up, because remember you're running away from the tiger, but right after you exercise, if you check, your blood pressure will have dropped. A lot of times people drop from like 150 down to 90 while they right after they exercise, because that's what it's supposed to do. But if your body gets used to doing that and you exercise on a regular basis, your blood vessels tend to stay open a bit more and the blood pressure stabilizes at a lower level. 
But yes, our goal is hopefully, unless you have any of those big risks, like you had a heart attack where you're going to be on some medicines, our goal is to get you off of as much as you can if it's just for prevention. Because you guys can do the rest of the other stuff, the diet and the exercise. The problem often is that we're not doing those things in conjunction, right? So, all right, one more. Why am I that high risk person? This is genetic. You have a genetic predisposition. Somebody else in your family has given you that gene, and you have probably shared it with any family member that you have given birth to. Um, and so that is genetic. There, there is nothing that you're going to be able to do if it's that high. Even if you ate only lettuce all of your life, you will never bring it down. You will need medication assistant. I, I can guarantee that one. Those are some of the family history. That's the things that we cannot change, unfortunately. That's similar for me. You know, my, my father, he had heart disease. He ran. We don't eat meat in our house. He's never smoked. He's not a diabetic. He just had the genetic predisposition because his father had heart disease. Well, that just puts me at risk. I mean, there's nothing I can do. But I was born to him. I can't do anything about it. But now I know since I know I can do everything I can in my power, I mean, hopefully I have my mother's genes, I don't know, but in case I don't, I will do everything in my power to prevent that from happening to me. I mean, I don't want bypass at 51. Um, and hopefully that will train my children to follow uh, you know, some good regimens at home so that they will also pass that on to you know, their children. And that's kind of how this works. All right? All right, thank you, everybody.